Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this week's Anur the Light. Too often we take jobs just to get by and our hearts remain elsewhere. Hani de Toy did just that until she gave it all up to follow her heart. Let's see her story. Hani de Toy discovered her calling as a communication coach and trainer after answering some difficult questions about herself. She now runs a business that teaches others to ask themselves these questions and work toward positive communication and behavior. I found myself um, leaving a few jobs in a very disgruntled frame of mind. My husband said something interesting to me one day when I complained about walking out on my third job. And he said to me, don't you think you need to consider what the common factor is? And I was mortified, to say the least. And in that space, I really needed to do some serious introspection and look to see what was there that I could be responsible for. And so I embarked on a journey of personal development and it was shock upon shock to discover that I'm actually not a very nice person. But I actually got to see that if I created that mess, maybe I also had the power to create something extraordinary. But it was a huge learning curve. And I started to see that if I could share that with people, that we'd all just get so much further and so much more joy. Communication coaching is a means of working with people to help them connect with the people they work with or the people in their lives. It's a framework that's very closely linked to conversational intelligence. And conversational intelligence is all about the way we engage with people to create trust, to um, really find a rapport um, so that we engage more from the common ground, more from how we are similar than how we are different. I'm going to be sharing with you one of the stories about what empowers me and encourages me to keep giving my best, to keep giving of myself to my work in the various environments that I work in. And it starts off more than 20 years ago when I was a high school teacher. As a former teacher, Hani has learned that the teacher-centered approach in the education system may not be the best teaching method. She has dedicated her time to assisting adults and youth in different ways. I think that there is a lot of room for a learner-centered approach to um, be more valuable. And um, my frustration in the school system is that teachers are bogged down by such a lot of administrative duties. Um, in how assessments are done and we've not focused on do we actually make a difference for each child. And I do believe that it's taken me a long road to then do the training, the learning, um, to identify what does then make a difference. And, and I'm very uh, excited about the work that I do now because I work with people who want to get to a new level. Um, in their life experience. It takes courage to leave a job and start a business, but Hani's passion for uplifting others was strong enough to see her take that leap of faith. In the month that I worked out my notice, I signed up to a business network and attended a few of the events so that I had some contacts out there in the field. And I left swiftly from my job into the business world. I remember sitting in the first few um, networking sessions and needing to stand up and say what I do and telling people I don't yet have a business name <laughs> and I'm still making up what I do and it slowly evolved from coaching one-to-one -to, -one to working with companies to really supporting the development of healthy cohesive teams that are open to each other's thinking styles, communication styles because we're diverse in so many different ways. Sometimes I just think it's great for people to take time to look through the kaleidoscope and just be pleasant to be actually living in an ever-changing world. And when you look through this and you see how there's the image is constantly changing and shifting, that's always beautiful. Um, I think if you ponder that, there's a lot of thought um, for or opportunity to realize that it's, it's actually okay to change our point of view and to be open to other points of view. Um, and to be willing maybe to just acknowledge we live in a world that's in flux. I created a set of blocks um, using an acronym PERFECT because that's what everybody thinks they're aspiring to is being perfect or at the very least wanting the perfect solution. And I think that's a burden that people place on coaches sometimes. It's like give me the silver bullet for, you know, whatever it is I'm dealing with. 
And so these blocks um, spell the word perfect using an acronym where each letter represents an area that actually the client can explore. You know, sometimes we think that we are dealing with something badly, but we haven't looked at our physical environment. So this has us first look at our physical environment. You know, are there any stresses or toxins even in our physical environment that could be impacting the way we feel or the behavior that we have? Hani used her life experiences to empower not only herself, but others too. She believes strongly in assisting the youth to better themselves through self-understanding and a connection with others. She is tutoring, so basically she comes here once a week and she helps the students to understand the content that was taught in the lecture much better and she helps them to have small group discussions on what was covered in the lecture and then to also assist with any aspect uh, of the content that the students might be grappling with. What's distinct about SIBA's education is that for the four years of their degree, students, it's compulsory for students to do a course in leadership and self-development. And I believe that this is particularly, well, this is what inspired me to get involved. When I heard this, I thought, this really puts these kids at the cutting edge of the business market when they leave university. Because they're delving into um, areas of self-development that many other people only get to when they are promoted to management positions. And even then, may only do when they do an MBA. So um, just the idea that they have to explore elements of themselves, explore questions about um, who they are and how they add value and how they want to pay it forward in the world. The success or the changes that we have seen is that they feel quite like it to have someone like Hani who goes beyond just being a teacher or sharing the content knowledge with them, but going out of her way to be a mentor and a coach to the students and adding value by also bringing her corporate experience and most importantly, always trying to find ways to be of assistance beyond our classroom expectations. Hani has shown that true education is about leaving people with a set of skills that make them feel whole, respected and confident in their abilities. Through honing proper communication, love and respect for others, she certainly is contributing to a brighter future. I too can attest to that and thankfully here I am, living my dream. We may not all be able to follow our hearts, but we can be happy with where we are. Mola Navam is standing by to answer this week's Q&A. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nahmadu wa nusalli wa nusallimu ala rasooli al-kareem. All praise is due to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And salutations be upon all the messengers of the Almighty and those who follow them in guidance. Welcome again to the Q&A section of the An-Nur program. And among the questions that we have today, one is what makes meat halal? A very important and a very relevant question. Allah in the Holy Quran, in chapter 6, verse 118 says, فَكُلُوا مِمَّا ذُكِرَ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ بِآيَاتِهِ مُؤْمِنِينَ Eat and take the name of the Almighty upon those animals that you slaughter. Keep in mind we are taking the life of a living being and that we are doing it for the sake of our needs. So Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has envisaged that when you take the life of a living being, you take it with the permission of the Almighty. And therefore, you take the name of the Almighty. And therefore, it is a requirement that you take the name of the Almighty when you slaughter the animal and you slaughter the essential veins that gives rise to the free flowing of blood. And any medical doctors have said that when there is a free flowing of blood, it takes and it emits and it exits all those particular type of bloods which is harmful and it is the best possible way with regard to making an animal suitable for consumption. So that is what makes an animal halal. Taking the name of the Almighty, I have recited the relevant verse with regard to it and cutting the essential veins. The second thing is, and the second question that has come is, is it permissible to put your parents in a home for the elderly? Firstly, we must, we must bear in mind that Almighty Allah and our Sharia place great emphasis upon looking after our aged parents. In many cultures, when our parents become old, they are looked upon as a burden. Islam doesn't look upon them as a burden. Islam look upon them 
as a means of gaining paradise. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on one occasion said, may that person's nose be rubbed onto the ground. In other words, may he be humiliated. May he be disgraced. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam repeated that three times. Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, who are you referring to? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that person who finds one of both his parents in old age and does not gain paradise by serving them. Here, the age parents becomes a means of paradise, not a means of burden. So it is as far as possible we look after them. Not right to put them in a home or elderly, we take over the responsibility of looking after them. If, however, there are situations where there is no one to look after them and there are such circumstances, unfortunately, as a last resort, it might be, you know, something that you could look at, but not something that is preferable. The third question that has come in, it's something that happens into our homes many a times. If our parents are making a bad decision that will affect the family, do I have the right to intervene? Yes. Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said, nasiha. Deen is well-wishing. So if you feel that the parents are doing something that might be harmful, you can approach the parents and tell them that this could cause this type of harm. However, there are one important point is, you can't force anyone to do anything against their will. And the second thing is, if you bring it forward to them, do it with the correct intention and the correct manner and methodology. You are not speaking to anyone, you are speaking to your parents. So if you want to highlight something to them which you feel will be harmful what they are doing, then do so with the requisite and the required respect and methodology. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us steadfast upon deen. Jazakallah for watching. If you have any other questions, do uh, write to us on the email address that is provided on the screen. Assalamu alaikum. Our children are a reflection of us and we have one chance to get it right. Raise them with taqwa and demand so that they can be the best versions of us. This is the theme for our topic. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Ya Rabbi salli alayhi wa sallam in an increasingly busy world bombarded by outside influences, raising children can be a scary feat. Tasneem Bashi believes that fostering taqwa or piety, even during pregnancy, is essential for a young Muslim's development. Reading Quran, reciting Darud Sharif is of utter and extreme importance on a number of levels. First of all, our baby's auditory system develops amazingly in utero. Baby hears mommy's voice predominantly over anything. What better sound than to hear mommy reciting Quran or reciting Darud Sharif? I make it a duty. It's out of habit now to recite constant Darud Sharif to baby. And I'm actually noticing a reaction out of baby um, when I do start that. When a baby is born in an Islamic home, we do. It's a daily activity that we're reciting Quran and we're reciting our du'as and so forth. It's not a foreign uh, sound to a baby. It's quite familiar to the baby. The baby takes yeah. comfort in hearing that. What they've heard in utero is the best thing for them to hear. Islam teaches us patience. You have to have an abundance of it. You can't expect to do an activity and watch this child um, miraculously roll around on week two. It's not going to happen, but your hard work and perseverance pays off. Baby Gym is, in essence, a movement program that stimulates um, baby's senses, muscles, and brain to develop optimally in its natural sequence. That helps baby with optimal development socially, emotionally, mentally, and uh, in regards to her cognitive development. It's a five-week program, and each week, mom and baby or gran and baby learns a different technique which they can practice at home. We work on a physical level. That's the first stage that develops between zero and 14 months. If you don't develop that physical part of baby's brain, we can't expect the social, emotional, cognitive level to develop later on in life. It's all about building that firm foundation 
for baby in order to build on that because that's what our brain development is, it's layers building upon each other. Children go through different development milestones in their formative years. Nurturing an environment with basic Islamic tenets and family values is just as important in fostering taqwa at preschool level. I think for me, taqwa, um, or iman, your faith, your degree of faith, that is something that we need to install in our children um, when they come in at home already. We only reinforce um, those particular, particular values and, and that the parents are supposed to teach them. Things like greeting, um, uh, the respect for, for your parents. If the respect isn't there for an, a child, that child won't learn what respect is all about. So we need to show that example as parents, as teachers, as adults in general. We are an independent school because our learners, they need to follow on into a mainstream school. We need to prepare them for um, secular education. You can't divide the two because Islamic um, education and secular ed education, it's, it goes hand in hand. At Habibia, the children start the day with thikr at the mosque. This prepares them for the day and at this tender age, they already create a ritual of calmness and spending time with their creator. We have an assembly every morning. We start our day with uh, the set of um, things that we recite. The, we, we, we build it up. We start initially with the Fatiha and the calls, and then we build it up to uh, the du'as that we introduce for sleeping. And also we, we read du'as pertinent to the month. So if it is the month of Muharram, we make them aware of the month of Muharram through the dhikr that we read. We start everything with, obviously, with Bismillah in the name of the Creator. And we also try to, to teach them through um, du'as that they read constantly. There's du'a for memory, du'a for knowledge, the, you know, du'a for drinking water, all those things. And we also close every day with a set of prayers. Teaching children taqwa is very important because we are not here to raise children only for ourselves. You know, we parents cannot be selfish and say, this child is mine and I'm going to make it only live in my little world. Children are created to go out in the world. So we have, a, we have to give them the tools. Taqwa is one of the most important because if, if a child understands where they're coming from and where they're going to, the journey in between is easier. We try to be to marry it with what they're doing at home. So we're not teaching them anything that is contradicting what they're learning at home. So for example, um, when they come in, they greet. The most important thing they do is they greet. Um, they, when they see each other, there's a certain way they have to act. There's a certain way they have to talk to each other. There's a certain way they address adults. We try to teach respect, you know, respect for property, respect for space. You know, all these things are very important. They have, Something that we, uh, we, we forget is they have boundless energy and exceptional memory and a great capacity to learn. So, you know, we embrace that and try to incorporate it in everything we do. From pregnancy to preschool, taqwa is an essential part of early childhood development. Raising young Muslims comes with a responsibility to ensure they seek knowledge and the path to the Almighty. <laughs> There is an Asian proverb that says, better to see something once than to hear about it a thousand times. Well, you get the opportunity to not only see, but also hear about the amazing places to visit in and around South Africa. The South African Air Force Museum in Port Elizabeth is home to an historical collection of military aircraft, including the oldest surviving jet fighter in South Africa. The museum was established in 1990 by a group of aviation enthusiasts who basically formed a club called the Friends of the Port Elizabeth Museum, Air Force Museum, and they established uh, a museum for aviation enthusiasts using military aircraft and things like that. The museum itself was opened at the end of 1990 and we've been here ever since. With an ongoing restoration project, the museum boasts a total of nine aircraft, aviation memorabilia, and even a simulator that everyone can enjoy. The uh, Port Elizabeth uh, Air Force Museum is the custodian of military aviation uh, in South Africa, the heritage of it. 
So here you would expect to see the kind of aircraft that participated in, in wars and uh, conflict in the last 100 years almost. The South African Air Force is almost 100 years old. So we've got aircraft that date back to 1939, one of them. Um, we've got also mock-ups of World War II fighters, a Spitfire, and then a lot of um, South African Air Force aircraft that participated in the Bush War. Uh, Puma, Mirage F1, Alouette that you can see in the background there. Um, and we've got them in, in varying uh, variations of, of the types that they can be. They say breakfast is the most important meal of the day and the owners at Old Bait Lodge certainly take this seriously. With a breakfast spread to die for, your day is all set to explore the wonders that Port Elizabeth has to offer. People are looking for good breakfast where they can feel at home, have some tasty food and Old Bait Lodge is the only place for them. We normally serve a variety of dishes because we get people from all over coming and having breakfast with us. So we have your normal buffet breakfast, you know, with your hot beverages, cold beverages, and a nice full spread buffet breakfast. You'll certainly want to try the masala scramble eggs, a speciality of this family-run business, along with a variety of breads and maybe a donut or two. Make a day of it by starting your breakfast at Albeit Lunch and popping by the beach for some fun in the sun. Well, I think in terms of something special at Albeit Lodge, definitely we normally serve a couple of signature dishes here at Albeit Lodge and that keeps our guests coming back for more and more all the time. Well, I think one of the signature dishes, which is my favourite, is normally our masala eggs. So for those guests that are looking for something a little bit different and something a little bit spicy on the tongue, we normally make a nice masala scrambled eggs at Albeit Lodge. Imagine swimming with sharks out in the open ocean as you explore the spectacular colourful reefs that Port Elizabeth has to offer. Pro Dive in Port Elizabeth allows one to have this experience by offering shark diving at Shark Rock Pier on Hobie Beach. Pro Dive is basically a dive centre, a very five star dive centre and we're also a water sports centre so we basically train people to dive and also offer charters uh, and specifically we specialise in shark diving in Port Elizabeth. Exploring the deep sea has never been this exciting. From beginner to instructor diving courses, you'll be on your way to being a pro in no time. We actually uh, get a lot of foreigners coming in and I do a lot of marketing for Port Elizabeth overseas. I've just been to the boot uh, show in, in Germany where people specifically want to see sharks. I mean, uh, sharks is, a, is an endangered species all over the world and we're lucky in, uh, in the Eastern Cape and South Africa that we've still, we, we rate it as a, one of the top shark destinations in the world. So I can basically guarantee people that when they come here that we dive with sharks and without cages, of course. If you're stopping by in PE and are up for a thrill, shark diving certainly will get your heart pumping. That's it from us. I'm filling my travel list with these wonderful places on our show. Shukran for tuning in and assalamu alaikum from me, Zahra Robinson. <laughs>